Two in a row. I'm sure Pastor Glenn is very happy. We got uh, Wednesday. He's come back refreshed to us and renewed. So we're looking forward to your sermon today. And I thank you for worshiping here this morning at the Fount on this very splendific day here in Southern California. And also, I give a very special holy shout out to all you online. Now, a few years back, I read a book. Ken Houts wrote, it was titled, You Are a Miracle Waiting to Happen, and I fully agree. You are a miracle waiting to happen because God is waiting to be a miracle through you. The Lord is in each believer to meet the needs of others by the power of the Spirit and the love of God. The needs of the visitors, the unchurched, and the unsaved cannot be met by the church staff. Only by equipping the saints do the, to do the work of the ministry will the church gather the harvest. Pastor Glenn's Sunday sermons are part of that process of equipping all you saints. Pastor Glenn's sermon today is titled, What is the Gospel? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to experience the joy of praising the Lord through singing and listening to the choir today. We ask that our hearts be open to listen to Pastor Glenn's sermon, What is the Gospel?, to equip us to bring the gospel to all the world. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you all will stand and join me, we're going to do... Karen's favorite, Majesty, and he is Lord.
you may sit down and I'll invite the kids to come up to join me up front here. One of the favorite songs that we sang at preschool when you guys were in preschool, and one of you still is. Which one do you think is still in preschool? <laughs> and who's a graduate? Yeah, that's right. This is the butterfly song. It's the favoriteest song of at least me, if not the kids. So here we go. Ready? Remember it? If I were a butterfly, Thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. And if I were a robin in a tree, I thank you, Lord, that I could sing. And if I were a fish in the sea, wiggle, I'd wiggle my tail and I'd giggle with glee. Good. But I thank you, Father, for making me me. Here's the chorus. Here we go. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Let's see some wiggly worms now. Show me. If I were a wiggly worm, I thank you, Lord, that I could squirm. And if I were an octopus, I thank you, Lord, for my fine looks. And if I were a kangaroo, you know I'd hop right up to you. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Here we go. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Let's see some elephant trunks now. If I were an elephant, I thank you, Lord, by raising my trunk. And if I were a crocodile, I thank you, Lord, for my big smile. And if I were a fuzzy wuzzy bear, thank you, Lord, for my fuzzy wuzzy hair. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Okay, everyone, big finish. Here we go. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me your child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me, me. Good. Wow, you guys did great. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrangle some motions out of you guys one of these days. I'm going to motion wrangler. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for fun songs that remind us of the truth that you love us just the way we are because you made us just the way we are. Help us to please you by how we treat one another and how we honor your name today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. You can go back. Uh, do I have class today? Yep. All right. Thank you, God, for the gift of education, for our children's desire to learn and grow, for friends who have similar interests but who challenge them in new ways, too. We pray their educators are inspired and energized every day by their calling. We pray this year would be led by you. Each day they would step through the door you open. Keep them safely protected and may you bless them with opportunities to be a light to others as they learn more about you. We ask for wisdom and strength to raise them up in the purpose and plan you have for them and the truth of your word. Amen. Amen. How many of you have children or grandchildren that are heading off to school this week or soon, if not already? Yeah. Awesome. Be sure to pray for them. Cover them in prayer. It's, it's a tough world out there right now. All right, we're going to enter into a season of prayer right now. We're going to begin with a confession, so I'm going to invite you to spend a few moments 
in silent reflection as you consider the sins of your lives, and then we'll lift them up as confession uh, to the Lord before we move into intercession and petition. And so let's pause for just a few moments as we uh, consider our lives and how we have or have not uh, met the demands of a righteous God. So, Lord, we confess to you that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory that you put before us in your Son, Jesus. Forgive us for the things that we have knowingly done that grieves your heart. Forgive us for the things that we have unknowingly done that grieves your heart. Forgive us for our thoughts and actions as well as our words that turn people not toward you but away from you and that turn our own hearts away from you. Give us your mercy now as we receive gratefully your forgiveness and we rededicate our lives to following in the footsteps of Jesus, to become his hands, his feet, his mouth, to become his presence, his body in this world. That is such a privilege and such an honor. We give you thanks for giving that to us and to all who would call upon his name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, invite our congregation online to go ahead and begin to pray for us as we share the joys and concerns of our hearts here at the, the Fount in person. So what are your joys and concerns this morning?
So God, we come before you with our hearts held out to you. So many, so many sorrows that we've experienced in the loss of loved ones, in illnesses. Lord, give us your comfort and your strength in the midst of all, all suffering, ours and those that we've lifted up today. We pray healing, we pray guidance, we pray strength. And we pray that you would use us as instruments of your peace in the midst of a world filled with turmoil and trouble. Help us to represent well your love for all humanity. Open our hearts to those around us who are desperately yearning for good news. And help us to be ready to share when that student asks, when that neighbor inquires, when that person in the line at the grocery store just makes a casual comment. Help us to be ready to share your love. In the name of Jesus. We pray for our neighbors, our communities, our cities, our state, and our nation, and those who are elected to guide us. We pray that you would give them your wisdom. Help them to make decisions that please you and that move us closer to the ideal of your kingdom. We pray for our police officers and firefighters, those who are standing between us and danger. We ask that you would protect them and bless them, and we give you thanks for their willingness to sacrifice on our behalf. And we pray for the men and women serving us in military uniform throughout the world and ask that you would protect them as well and watch over them and bring them home safely once their mission is complete. And we thank you for the safety that they provide from the aggressors in the world. And we pray for our church, Lord, as we continue the process toward disaffiliation and being free from a denomination that we are no longer at home in. We pray that you would pave the way, that you would soften the hearts, and that you would make a way when there seems to be no way. For us and for all those yearning to be free, to express their faith freely and openly according to their conscience. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, it is time for the offering. And there is a joy box in the back. If you brought your offering with you today, you can drop it in the joy box on your way out, or you can use the instructions on the screen or the back of the bulletin to make your contributions in other ways. Whatever way you choose, we thank you for your willingness and, uh, and readiness to continue supporting the work and ministry of the Fount. Now Trevor and the choir are here with us to share a special anthem. Isn't it great to have the choir back? As we are approaching the end of summer, though it doesn't feel like it, um, I'm excited to get more music prepared for the choir to present before all of you. But this piece today is titled, uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, as we look into the meaning of what is the gospel and you know, preparing ourselves to be in the mission field and explain at any time, what do you believe? Why do you believe it? For I am convinced, and this is what I believe. So as we look towards this, I, I ask you to see it with the reflection of 
the cross is the most wondrous element of our faith, that we were able to be able to serve a Lord who was willing to die for us to take away all of our sins. So as we, as we sing this, uh, I invite you towards the end of the piece, when we reach the, the final verse, sing along with us um, and, and join us in uplifting um, the mighty power of the cross.
thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply its reach and influence. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't sit down. <laughs> it's a little different today having it in the middle, but <clears throat> here we go. I'm going to pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we get to come and worship you today. And I pray that you would be glorified in what we do and we say. And God, I just, I thank you for your love for us. Despite what we do or don't do, you still love us the same unconditionally. And we thank you for that. We give you this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from his side. No greater sacrifice than what he's done. What he's done. future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life has Thank you for your sacrifice for us, that you loved us so much to die for us. And God, I'm sorry for taking that for granted sometimes. God, we, we pray that you would truly transform us, our minds, our hearts, our thinking, our actions, that we would give it to you because of what you did for us.
God, we thank you for this time of worship. We give it to you. We pray that you would be with us for the rest of this day and that you would be glorified in everything we do and say and think. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which you also stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. From 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. We're into the final two weeks of the series Corinthian Questions. The Corinthian church, as we remember, had a lot going on internally and eternally, but internally specifically. There were problems concerning doctrine, and there were problems between groups in the church. The book of 1 Corinthians appears to be a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church to answer some of the questions that they had. And we've covered a lot of ground in the last 10 weeks. It's all been very important material, and I say that because we're moving to two vitally important topics in this letter to the Corinthian church. All that we're, we've covered is from the Word of God, and thus it is important. But everything we've discussed up to this point rises or falls on the topics we're looking at today and next Sunday. Today our topic is discussed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, Dennis just read for us. The question today from Corinth is, what is the gospel? The word gospel is used a lot within Christian circles. We talk about the gospel a lot here in our church at the Fount. We preach the gospel. We believe the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of us are not strangers to the word. But what do we mean when we say gospel? Remember that Paul was writing to a real group of people, the Corinthians, and Corinth was a Greek city. They knew the Greek language, and they knew what Paul meant when he used the word gospel. What did the Greeks think of when they heard that word? When ancient Greeks heard the word gospel, they thought about victory. To them, the word meant the news of victory. Some other group was defeated, and they had won. The Greeks made a big deal out of announcing victories. The person who got to announce the victory was prepared for the announcement. His spear would be decorated. He'd have his head crowned with laurels, olive branches, or something like that. Sacrifices were made as he arrived. The buildings would be decorated, and then the person would come in bringing the news of victory. Everyone would cheer at this good news. When the Greek Corinthians read Paul's word, gospel, their minds would think of the good news of victory. Listen again to 1 Corinthians 15, just the first two verses now of that chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. I want to remind you, says Paul, of the good news of victory I proclaim to you and you believed, the good news of victory you stand on, the good news of victory that saves you. So the good news of victory the Corinthians had heard from Paul was that they believed where they stood and, that, and what saved them. They knew that. It sounds like some really good news, doesn't it? it? Sounds like this good news led them to believe in something, something that saved them. What was this good news of victory, this gospel? 
Let's focus in on verse 3 in 1 Corinthians 15. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This is the good news of victory message. This is the good news of your salvation. He wants to remind the Corinthians and you and me of what he had told them when he first got there, that this message was the message he gave them and that this message they believed. Because they believed this message, they were saved. They believed Paul's good news of victory, and they were saved. And what was this good news of victory, this gospel? So Paul says, here it is. Remember this good news? For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. So there's the good news of victory. There's the gospel. The gospel has three parts. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. The first part of the good news of victory is that someone died. At face value, this doesn't sound seem like very good news. There doesn't seem to be any victory in that. But this someone who died, how is that a victory? Well, who is this someone who died? Christ, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Anointed One. And where's the good news of victory in Jesus is dying? For our sins. The Messiah didn't die for himself. He didn't die for his sins. He died for our sins. Our sins bring a death sentence. We are guilty before a sinless and holy God for our sin. And God's judgment for a sinner is death. If you sin, you die. And this is more than physical death. It's the death of our souls and our spirits. Our body dies and our spirit experiences a spiritual death, an eternal separation from the holy God. The death of a sinner is hell. But the Christ, Jesus, died for our sin. He substituted himself for us. He died in our place. We no longer have to be separated from God because Jesus died in our place. He met the requirements we have as sinners by giving himself to death for us. The first part of this good news of victory is that Jesus died for us. That he was buried. What good news of victory can be found in a dead, buried body? Well, Jesus didn't take the easy way out. He didn't fake his death. He didn't do what some, uh, some type of divine hocus-pocus. His heart stopped and his vital organs shut down. He was clinically and physically dead. What does it matter? It matters because Jesus went the full length to save us. He gave himself up for us to the very end. He didn't back out. He didn't take the easy way out. He gave everything he had to every one of us. The second part of the good news of victory is that Jesus loves us so much that there was no price that he wouldn't pay for us. And number three, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus died for us. He suffered to the very end for us. But that wasn't the end of Jesus. And that wasn't the end of the good news of victory either. Jesus rose from the grave. That means he took back life. He really died on the cross for our sins. And he was really buried in a tomb for three days. There's no doubt he was dead. It wasn't just a myth. And then he came back to life again. That's the good news of victory. That's the good news, the gospel. He was victorious over death. Death came after him, but he won. He proved his divinity. He proved he was the conqueror. 
Death always has the last word. We die, and that's it, but not since Jesus rose again. He has power over death. He defeated death. He proved to us that he is more powerful than death. When he says we trust in him and have eternal life, we know it's true because he is bigger than death. I know I have eternal life, life after death because Jesus proved that he conquered death. Let's read it again, the passage, verses 3 and 4 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. In a nutshell, there it is. That's the gospel. That's what the Corinthians had come to believe. And by their faith, they were saved. Do you believe? Have you experienced the good news of victory? Are you saved? I would encourage you that if you have questions or you have concerns, that you talk with someone, and maybe in your small group, or call me up, we'll talk. If there's something that uh, rubs you the wrong way about what I've said today, or uh, maybe it made sense to you for the first time, it would be good to talk through and to pray about what you have experienced and what God is doing in your heart. Next week, we're going to conclude this series on Corinthian questions with What about the resurrection? I invite you to read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19 in preparation for next week. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. But right now, let's pause for a few moments of quiet, prayerful reflection as we consider what God may be saying to us today. As we close our service this morning, before we begin singing our final hymn, I want to draw your attention to the fifth verse, or the fifth chorus, technically. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. If the sermon that you just heard resonated with you, I would ask you, boldly sing this hymn, that, and can it be I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain. What a wondrous and marvelous God we serve. Amen? Amen. Would you stand and sing with me our closing hymn this morning, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? Number 363, the words will appear on the screen.
Would you lift a hand for the Lord? <laughs> Amen. Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer, uh, said that that hymn by Charles Wesley is the greatest hymn of all time. And uh, every year at the New Room Conference, uh, we sing that at the close of the conference. And you have not sung that hymn until you've sung it with 2,000 voices belting out as loud as they can uh, the chorus, Bold I Approach the Eternal Throne. Yeah. Amen. All right. Ah. Let's, let's just stay. Let's not go. Let's just, stay. Let's just keep, keep worshiping. All right. Yeah, I know you have lunch. And, and you have uh, church council which we'll meet uh, in 20 plus minutes over up in room 205. So if you're on the church council, please be there. If you're not on the church council and you want to just come up and, and listen in, you're welcome to do that as well. But for now, go in peace, and may the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ go with you and remain with you always. <laughs>